Bible Believers Fellowship airs a half-hour Bible study program each week. You can find them permanently posted for free download at bbfohio.com. And you can listen to the latest half-hour study by listening Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on 91.5 Freedom FM. Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and our study of Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 titled The Sea of Glass. This message is part of our ongoing expository study of the book of Revelation but is also a very important part of our studies on the Genesis Gap. So we would encourage you to not only go to BBFOhio.com and listen to the more than 40 hours of Revelation studies that led up to this study in Revelation 15, but also to visit our video topical page for the Genesis Gap and see our messages along with other materials on that page from J. Vernon McGee, Gaines Johnson, Oliver B. Green, Chuck Missler, C.I. Schofield, Clarence Larkin, Peter Ruckman, David Peacock, J.R. Church, Gary Stearman, Tom Horn, Michael Pearl, Jeffrey Mortis, and dozens of other great Bible teachers that we agree with to varying degrees on other matters. But these and other men of God have agreed with the reality of the Genesis Gap Doctrine and provide useful materials for our learning and edification. And at the end of part two, we will also include a 10-minute video episode uh, produced by Brother Gaines Johnson, who authored the book, the Bible, Genesis, and Geology. So watch for that after part two. This is a very important study, and we know uh, that you will enjoy it. And we now join part one of two of our study of Revelation 15, 1 to 4, the Sea of Glass. Uh, we're going to cover verses 1 through 4, and let's go ahead and read that text. Read it with me. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Amen. Now, we, are, uh, uh, we have already seen the seals and the trumpet judgments. They're complete. And I'll repeat this, there are some good men who teach the book of Revelation and they teach that all these run parallel with each other. And uh, I teach uh, the way I see it laid out, uh, that these are not parallel and that they're in um, sequence. They're, they run exactly chronologically as we're seeing them. But if you disagree with me on that, that's really neither here nor there. But uh, we've in our study, seeing that these seals and trumpet judgments are complete, there are some similarities that you can go cross back and forth with, but there's differences as well. Um, and what we're uh, seeing in Revelation 15, the heavenly preparations for the seven vile judgments. Now, um, because of the new versions, you'll hear them called bold judgments. Um, but the scripture, uh, the King James references to vials. And it's called another sign there in verse 1. It said, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. See, just that language right there, you don't have to agree with me, but it seems to me like it's saying that these are the last plagues. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> the ones we studied before were not the last plagues. And these are, which would mean that it's not parallel. Amen? amen? Okay. Yeah, amen. 
And now it says, for in them, what? These last plagues are, is filled up the wrath of God. Now, again, we've talked about this, but i got to throw it in there. There is a false teaching where people will try to di uh, do a dissection and say that the day of the Lord is not the great tribulation, and the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. Now, the reason they're teaching that is because they have an agenda to rob you of your hope of an imminent rapture. And you say, well, what's one thing got to do with another? Well, if they can make believe that the great tribulation is not the wrath of God, and then they can dice up Mark 13 and Matthew 24 to make it look like that rapture there is for the church and it comes after that tribulation and it doesn't come until the wrath of God comes. And so they teach this thing called pre-wrath rapture, which comes right at the end. And it's all nonsense. Uh, it says right here that these last plagues, all seven of them, fill up the wrath of God. And they don't happen in the last day of the seven-year tribulation. So you can see that. I uh, hope you can see that as I present it. But we have a picture here of seven angels with seven vials, and they're on a sea of glass. And that's what we're going to focus our attention on, uh, this sea of glass, because I think you'll be surprised if, again, Scripture with Scripture, you look at how God lays this thing out, and in them is filled up the wrath of God. The day of the Lord includes the great tribulation, which is the wrath of the Lamb and is the wrath of God. Don't let anybody talk you into separating those because it will cause you to be confused. The day of the Lord includes the great tribulation, which is the wrath of the Lamb and is the wrath of God. And I'll give uh, my wife a second to take pictures. <laughs> she puts them up on the internet. and you know. So the sea sets the scene. You see that sea of glass is what sets the scene that we're studying. It said, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. I want you to focus in on this idea of the sea of glass. The mingled with fire uh, is, is very interesting. We're not going to get into that tonight. But this sea of glass, um, and it says, as it were, a sea of glass. So it's not glass as you and I think of it, like that window back there. It's as it were a sea of glass. You need to get that. And you see a sea of glass mingled with fire. Get that pictured in your head. If you know, basically what I'm going to show you is if you think, if you've ever uh, uh, seen or walked on ice and it's just as smooth as can be, and then right at the end of the ice, we used to have a bonfire. And the first thing I thought of when I first read that years ago was these ice skating at night and then there's this fire and the fire would actually glow off of the ice and that's the imagery you're seeing there in heaven now we saw this same reference to a sea of glass when we studied Revelation 4 and in chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 6 started out by saying and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and we saw in Revelation 14 that it was this one like the Son of Man on a throne. And now in verse 15, or chapter 15 we see again, before the throne, a sea of glass like unto crystal. So it's not saying it's crystal. It's not saying it's glass. It's saying, hey human beings, this is the best you can do as far as understanding what you're looking at here in the book of Revelation. This is a spectacular scene. This sea was represented in the temple. And if you've read your Old Testament, you might remember the building of the temple. In uh, 1 Kings 7, 23, it starts out saying, And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other it was round all about. And then verse 25 it says, It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north and three looking toward the west and three looking toward the south and three looking toward the east. You know why that is? Because in heaven there are beasts, beast-like creatures in heaven. And this molten sea that sat within the uh, outer court of the temple, this molten sea is picturing what's in heaven. 
And this molten sea had these beasts that carried it, and the sea was set above upon them. All their hinder parts, hinder parts were inward. And earlier before that, if you remember reading through Exodus, we're told that this sea was in a laver, and it stood between. Now, this is important. You've already seen the sea of glass in heaven is before the throne. And in the temple, in the tabernacle layout, this laver, which was the sea, the molten sea, stood between, look at that, the congregation and the altar, the throne. I'm convinced that what I've heard, I've heard several men teach this, so I'm not going to give credit to any one of them because I've heard it taught numerous times, and I'm convinced they're right. I believe that the tabernacle not only pictures Jesus, if you see the furniture and the uh, sacrifice it's themselves, but also the layout pictures the universe. Amen. That's right. And between you and me, the congregation, and the altar, the throne, is water. Amen. A sea. Look at Exodus 40 Verse 7, And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. Everybody look at me just for a second. Uh, and I don't want to lose you. Some of you, if you haven't read your Bible and you're not familiar with this, you might get a little lost. That's why you got to get in the book. you got to read that book and get familiar with it. But let me tell you this. If you will listen to the news, and you'll listen to all this stuff going on in space with telescopes and with probes being sent to outer space, they're trying to figure out why there's water everywhere. Yep. Amen. There is water out there yep. beyond our atmosphere. And they can see, like on Mars, they see the evidence of water. They see it on other planets. They know that when stars go through the process, uh, their life cycle, that when they burn out, they actually produce water. Why, why is there all that water out there? It's interesting. And God has this picture in between His throne, which is north, the sides of the north of the universe, outside of the universe, you go due north, and between that and where you are right now is this expanse of darkness and we're going to see water. Amen. Now, the origin of this sea is found in the book of Genesis where God placed a sea between His throne and the earth. It's in Genesis. Look at Genesis. Go ahead and turn there if you will. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to throw this in there because it's necessary. Amen. Young earth creationism has a glitch. Amen. And it's called, called the gap. And I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a young creationist or a young uh, creation believer because I believe that, uh, that six, the seven days of creation in Genesis 1 happened somewhere around 6,000 years ago. Amen. But there was something here before that. And if you look in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Now, this little thing here, it connects it, but it tells you that something else is happening. This isn't the same thing. And it says, And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God does not create darkness and void. Something happened between here and there. And I'm not going to cover all this today. I'm going to actually be teaching on that Sunday. We're going to go into more depth about this. And you're going to see that God Himself says He does not create things form and void. And I'm not going to tell you where you can look it up or come Sunday. But this is where that water... Now listen, it, it tells you this. Well, that, 
I'm going to get into that next week, so I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go, come back Sunday and you'll get some more information on this. But I want to tell you something. The, the, this young earth creation is being taught, it's being taught and it's being, um, they're ignoring Scripture. And then they are using, I'm just going to tell you flat out, they're using ungodly methods to shut people down who don't agree with them. Somebody's got something to hide when they will strong arm, intimidate, and shun people who disagree with them on this subject. So come back on Sunday and you'll, you'll learn more about it. But uh, it says here that the darkness was on the face of the deep. Now listen, that's not the ocean. It's deep space. Amen. Right. And I'm going to show you in a minute, it can't be the ocean because it says it's frozen. There's no frozen deep ocean. But it says the he, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, I've got to advertise a book here. If you haven't read What Dwells Beyond by Jeffrey Morris, he goes into de in depth about the darkness. And it is a fascinating study. That, that brother has really put some stuff in there. But uh, I don't have time to cover all that in one night. It says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay? So there are waters. God created the heaven and the earth, and there are waters. Now this deep, as I said, is not a reference to the deep ocean, but deep space. And these waters are left over from a judgment after Genesis 1.1. God created the heaven and the earth. That was perfect. You know why? Because God created it. But something happened and there was darkness and void without form. And that is the judgment. And Sunday I'll show you where the Bible tells you what it is, describes it. Goes in detail. Now... I want to run one reference to this, and that's in 2 Peter 3. So turn there if you can. It's the second epistle of Peter, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And this condition of the world that was is described by Peter. And I want to tell you something. We're about to read about a flood in 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Every time in the Bible God is talking about Noah's flood, He names Noah. Noah is not in this flood. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Are you there? Yeah. Read verses 3 and 4 with me. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now look. I'm teaching you one thing as you're reading the Bible. If you don't learn anything else, get this. You ignore that, you will not get it. This is called context. What's it say? From the beginning of creation. In the beginning, God created. That's what it's telling you. It's telling you to look at Genesis chapter 1 for your point of reference. That's what this is about to talk about. It's not talking about Noah's flood. Now, how familiar does that look? It ends, from the beginning of creation. Look up here. From the beginning of creation. Does that not look exactly what you're looking at there? Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's your context. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, that puts us at Genesis 1, 1, and now Peter will describe Genesis 1, 2. Compare them. That's how you know. Scripture with Scripture. That's how you know what you're reading. Verses 5 through 7. Verse 5 says, I want to read it to you because I'm going to stop and start. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the Word of God the heavens were of old. What's that? Genesis 1 1. Mm -hmm. John 1 1 through 3. Right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The in the same, the in the beginning. Begin you're missing me up, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> all, verse 3 says all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. God created all things through Him. Jesus. Jesus is what? The Word. The Word. So by the Word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That's Genesis 1-2. Compare it. Here it is. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. waters. Folks, let me ask you something. Where did that come from? It never said God created the water yet. Because that's not part of creation week in Genesis 1. It's already there. Amen. And you're told not to believe that by young earth creationists. That's right. You're told to ignore what you read in the Bible. And I don't give a flip who gets angry with me. I'm not going to ignore something that's right there in the Bible. Amen. 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 Now, I want, to, I want to tell you something. I'm just telling you how it is. I appreciate men who take on evolution. But you got Ken Ham down here who's gone off the deep end with his agenda. He's using the Vatican versions. He no longer uses the King James. And he's using millions of dollars to build a fake Noah's Ark. And he's in a financial trouble now and he's begging people to ba bail him out. What am I saying? I'm saying that once you go off and start messing with God's book, he messes with your mind. Yes. Ken Hovind's in prison right now. Why? He wouldn't listen to anybody who went and told him, listen, Kent, your ministry isn't supposed to be fighting the IRS. Your ministry is supposed to be preaching the gospel. But he wanted to take on the U.S. government. So he's in prison until 2015. You start messing with a book, God will mess with your mind. I'm just telling you, that's the way it is. Now Peter explains what cause of without form and void of Genesis 1-2 here. That phrase, without form and void, there's a cause. And it's right here. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. The world that was, where? Back in Genesis 1. That world perished. And it was overflowed with water. Verse 7. Go ahead and read that with me. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh -huh. Where's Noah in there? Where did it mention Noah or the ark? Uh -uh. It doesn't because it's not what it's talking about. That's right. And that is what you're going to find is this is where that frozen firmament comes into play. This is not Noah's flood and every time the flood of Noah is discussed, Noah is mentioned. Noah is not mentioned in this text. Now, I can't, I said Sunday I'm going to teach more on this. But if you want to learn more about the gap, I want you to look up here at this list. And I want you to look at the men of God who taught this, and still some of them are still alive teaching it. But I want to ask you something. Why are so many modern teachers, including most of the young earth creationists, junking the King James Bible and the doctrines? that fundamental Christians have believed right up until the last couple of decades. Because the devil's messing with their minds. Amen. These are the men who teach what you're hearing tonight and you're going to hear Sunday. These newbies come on and they use Vatican versions, all but Kent Hovind and maybe one or two other ones. They're all using false Bibles and they're trying to tell you not to believe what you read. Why? I think they're deceived. And that's why then you're seeing these guys waste millions of dollars on this nonsense. But uh, they'll try to... Well, I'm not going to go through all that. But they, you, you recognize some of these names. Chalmers, Pember, Schofield, Larkin, Peter Ruckman, David mm -hmm. Peacock, Michael Pearl, Oliver B. Green, Curtis yep. Hudson, Les Feldick, who's still alive, Gaines Johnson, still alive, Marty Reese works with James, uh, Gaines Johnson, Stephen Dill, still alive, J. Vernon McGee, Arthur Cust Custis, uh, Donald Barnhouse, Watchman Nee, J.N. Darby, George Mueller, Robert Luganbill, Chuck Missler, J.R. Church, Tom Horn, Gary Stearman, James Lawrence, Bill Haig, Oliver B. Green, R.A. Torrey, and that's just the, the beginning of the men who had this understanding of Scripture because it's what it said. And now you're seeing these Johnny-come-latelys who just happen to be just in time for Laodicea start abandoning the doctrines that they've actually were raised on a lot of them mm -hmm. 
Now God took these waters that we read about in Genesis in 2 Peter and these existed before day one, which is Genesis 1-3. And uh, uh, it, it, what we call the post-gap recreation began and he divided them on day two. So there's this water and the earth is in the water and out of the water. And then on day two, which is Genesis 1 verses 6 and 7, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now again, the young earth creationists tell us that's just talking about the water that was around the earth and then water on the earth. It can't be, and I'm going to show you in just a minute. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. Now one reason we know that can't be the waters that were around the atmosphere of the earth is because the Bible says the sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament. And the waters are above that. So the scriptures clearly teach this model and in Psalm 148.4 it says this. Read it with me. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens. Hallelujah. How does waters get up there? Because when God divided the waters and He put them above the firmament, they're outside of the universe. They're at a place that we call the sea of glass. Amen. Amen. Here's a picture of what... Uh, I got this from kjvbible.org. And this is the picture you get. And you have waters on earth's surface. And then the first and second heavens. And then the waters here are above the firmament. And then you have God's throne. And God's throne, in front of God's throne is a sea of glass. Be sure to visit our website at bbfohio.com for links to hundreds of audio and video messages, as well as articles, links, and other free resources, and a new bookstore being developed offering additional items. This message was brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house.